Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wa ta'ala wa barakatuh. This morning I am going to discuss about the enterobius vermicularis. And enterobius vermicularis is one of the intestinal nematode. It has got many common names such as pinworm, threadworm, sitworm. And this is along with the trichuris trichuria one of the large intestinal nematode so it can live in the cecum appendix or ascending colon in 1865 the scientist called Leukert first described the complete life cycle of enterobius vermicularis as far as the prevalence of enterobius is concerned this is one of the ancient human infection and cosmopolitan in nature the Helminthic infections that we have described so far is more common in the warm climate like in the tropical and subtropical countries but alike those this enterobiasis is more common in temperate and cold climate and this is one of the highly prevalent helminthic infections that everyone at one time of, uh, or other has suffered from pinworm infections worldwide 20, 200 million people are infected with the enterobiasis and among them 30 percent are children in the usa this is one of the most common helminthic infections infecting about 10 percent of their population and 30 percent again are children among them and this is like the other helminthic infections that it can affect all ages and socioeconomic levels but normally most of the common helminthic infections are prevalent in the poor or lower socioeconomic status and as far as the age is concerned although it can happen to any age but five to ten years age are the highest prevalence of enterobiasis in the morphology, this is uh, dioecious helminth, the nematodes, it has got the male and the female variety. It's a very tiny worm and it's a white fusiform in appearance with the pointed ends. You can see from here, the ends are pointed and it resembles like a thread. That's why the common name is thread worm. The most prominent morphological appearance is the presence of cervical alley which are the cuticular expansions at the anterior end and there are three cervical alley in total and also it has got the double bulb in the esophagus which are not uh, like the other helminths that we have described and we will be describing in future the male and the female adult worm as you know for other helminths the male are always a bit shorter in size than the female and the male has got the posterior end quite curved where the posterior end of the female parasite is pointed and the male has got the copulatory spicule and uh, it has got a short lifespan of about seven weeks where the female is uh, has got the long lifespan of about third up to 13 weeks and this is oviparous oviparous means you know that female lays egg the egg are a bit different in morphology than the other eggs that we have described for other helminths it is a colorless or non biolistin egg and it has got a very characteristic shape we call the plano convex you see one side of the egg is plain and the other side is convex so it resembles like the uh, alphabet d in english the egg has got the double layered transparent shell with sticky outer albuminous layer but it's not like ascaris lambricoides which has got the thick albuminous layer thrown into rugosities but it is a uh, albuminous layer which is quite uh, less uh, conspicuous than that of the ascaris lambricoides and this egg contains a tadpole like 
larva coiled inside the egg you see inside there is a tetrapod like larva and egg can be viable up to two weeks in the exterior of the large intestine in this regard i'd like to mention and ask you to remember what are the other non bile stain eggs because sometimes we classify the helminthic eggs into bile stain and non bile stain and it's a fascinating question sometimes to be asked that can you mention the bile stain and non bile stain egg of the helminths so as already we have mentioned that this enterobius vermicularis egg is a non bile stain and there are few others like the ankylostoma duodenali that we have covered the hookworm the Necrator americanus another member of the hookworm and of course the hymenolopis nana which is one of the cystod that we will be covering uh, in the next block so all these four are common non bile stain eggs and there is a mnemonic you can remember a hen laid non bile stain eggs a means ankylostoma duodenali h means hymenolopis nana e means enterobius vermicularis and n means Necrator americanus now, as far as the life cycle of Enterobius vermicularis is concerned, you can follow these uh, steps of the life cycle, and this is uh, basically transmitted through contact, and this is a contagious, you know, worm infection. So, egg remains in contact with the hands of the infected person, and this. Uh, Invisible eggs are swallowed or inhaled sometimes. The swallowing is the most common route, but sometimes it can be inhaled too to cause the infection. Then the pin worm hatches in the small intestine from the egg. As you know, we have mentioned the tadpole-like larva reside inside the egg. So that larva comes out in the small intestine in the first place. And the adult pin worm attaches to the lining of the intestine and eventually it migrates to the large intestine, the cecum ascending colon or the vermiform appendix, the ultimate abode of the enterobius vermicularis. But whenever the female worm becomes pregnant, during the act of laying egg, usually they come out of the colon to the rectum. That's very peculiar of this worm that they do not lay egg inside the colon. Rather, the female, for the purpose of laying egg, they usually come out to the colon, to the rectum and perianal region. And the pinworm <coughs> exists the rectum at night and lay thousands of eggs in the anal area. And this egg stick on the perianal regions cause intense itching and cause sleep disturbance which is the most pronounced uh, symptoms usually uh, enterobiasis patient experience with. Now what happens with this intense itching? The infected person usually scratches to remove the sticky eggs and that's how it gets stuck with the fingers and the nails of the infected person. Now whenever the person get infected by touching the hands to mouth or contaminates other household items usually this is the mode of transmission for the enterobius vermicularis and this is this can cause the auto infection by the infected person itself because of the habit of you know uh, hand to mouth uh, the touching uh, which is quite common in the children and also the children can touch the other you know uh, utensils present in the household and if that is shared by the other people in the same house so the infection can be transmitted to the other member of the house and that's how the enterobiasis life cycle you know goes on now regarding the for the details of the life cycle you see the eggs they come with the ingestion usually but sometimes with inhalation Firstly, to the small intestine, where the larva hatches out from the egg, and the larva gets molting and maturation in the cecum, which is the part of the large intestine, and they become developed into male and female adults. And there is a time frame that from egg to larva it takes about five weeks, from larva to adult about two to four weeks. But what happens is very peculiar to this particular worm that whenever the female get fertilized by the male worm, there is no 
purpose of the male to live on so male usually dies after the fertilization when the female is gravid now the female will continue the life cycle and there is no male anymore because the male has died after the fertilization now what happens the female after being gravid for the purpose of laying egg as i've mentioned that they come out of the rectum they migrate to the uh, out of the colon they migrate to the rectum and they come through the anus during the night time and lays thousands of eggs on the perianal perineal skin and as you can see from here that a worm single worm can lay up to 5000 to 17000 eggs per day you can assume the huge number and the magnitude of infection out of this huge number of the egg the egg becomes infective in six hours on the perianal skin so it takes time a few hours to become infected and uh, the complete life cycle of the enterobius vermicularis takes about two weeks to two months so it quite it, it could be quite short like the other helminthic infections now already we have given you the hints about the transmission of enterobius vermicularis one of the very important mode of transmission is self-infection and reinfection uh, this can only occur if infective eggs are ingested usually by the hand to mouth and this is a very common practice for the children that whenever they get infected the female lays egg on the perineal skin it evokes the intense itching so naturally there is a scratching of the perineal skin and the sticky egg gets stuck on the nail bed and the hand and the finger and whenever they put mouth without washing that they get infected and this is called the self-infection and reinfection as well because the same person is reinfecting himself or herself again and again but there is also person-to-person -person transmission and this can occur through the contact of the contaminated fomites with the pinworm eggs such as the bed linens, clothing, toilet handles, doorknobs, towels, furniture, you know, cell phones, remote control, so and so forth. And with these contaminate, contaminated fomites, it can be swallowed to spread the infection. Uh, and remember that the infective egg can survive up to three weeks on indoor fomites. So it's a quite long time that the survival of the egg can still transmit the infection. And there is also a rare mode, which is airborne transmission by inhalation. The tiny eggs can be inhaled through the respiration. This is also rare, but possible. Now, the two things are to be remembered and noteworthy for enterobius vermicularis infection is the auto-infection and retro-infection. Auto-infection already we have described that the same person harboring the worm can be infected time and again and this auto-infection because the source is himself or herself. The, you know, the agent, uh, infecting agent is not coming from exterior, it's the same person. So this is the auto-infection. And but what about the retro infection the retro infection is that sometimes the eggs that hatch out on the perianal skin they become larva the larva can hatch out from the egg and that larva can crawl back into the anus to mature into the adult to the large intestine again so it can you know come through the you know retrogradely from the anus to the uh, uh, the, the large intestine rather from the mouth to the large intestine the usual route is that usually somebody ingests the infected egg through the mouth and it gets ultimate about to the large intestine that's the normal route we call the uh, prospective but in retro retrograde infection it comes from the back from the behind so this is always a possibility for the enterobiasis so these two things uh, you can assume that can pile up the load of infections and magnitude of infection of the infected person because the auto infection and infections are the possibility with the enterobiasis. Now, as far as the clinical manifestations are concerned, the most pronounced presentation is the pruritus ani, and this is because of the adherence of the mucoid secretion of the egg causing intense irritation. Uh, as a result, the person infected do scratching 
and by that they can cause excoriation of the skin and skin rash may be developed and with that it develops the person develops the sleep disturbance irritability nocturnal aneurysis loss of appetite weight loss pallor because of the loss of appetite and you know uh, irritability and sometimes abdominal pain so this is one that pruritus ni can lead to uh, other manifestations too but uh, the severe infection sometimes can lead to other manifestations like the neurosis the patient become neurotic at times not behaving normally and uh, patient can have the nail biting the grinding teeth at night and of course there is possibility of secondary bacterial infections so you can see this picture with heavy enterobiasis infections that in the perianal region the small tiny thread like worms all around now there is a term called ectopic enterobiasis and the word ectopic means abnormal locations or abnormal habitat of enterobiasis vermicularis because normally the enterobiasis vermicularis they remain in the large intestine and at best they can come to the perianal skin but what if if they go to other sites which are not normal uh, location for the worm they can cause the ectopic enterobiasis and with their complications so in rare cases the female pin worm can travel from the anal area up to the vagina and uterus in case of female because of their close proximity and then they can ascend up to the fallopian tube and around pelvic organs and of course in the male it can also reach to the urethra and through that to the prostate so if they can reach to this uh, you know genital tract organs in both female and the male they can cause inflammation to these uh, different parts of the genital tract of male and female like the vulvo vaginitis that can lead to vaginal discharge sometimes chronic salpingitis endometritis in case of male prostatitis urethritis and sometimes the dead worm can give rise to the granuloma in the peritoneal cavity and also there could be abscess formation because of the secondary bacterial infections carried by the worm itself so we can expect all these complications although rare but it's possibility with the ectopic enterobiasis sometimes in the literature it is reported that the pinworm have been associated or found in the appendicitis cases but it's not sure whether they are the causal effect of the appendicitis i mean the whether they're the agent causing the appendicitis or this is just an association because they can remain in the appendix too because appendix is a part of large intestine sometimes the pinworm may also contribute to urinary tract infections because the uropathogen uropathogenic bacteria sometimes from the rectum like you know the e coli is very much prevalent as a normal flora in the you know rectum intestine and that escherichia coli which are uropathogenic bacteria can be carried by this worm pin worm to the urinary tract because of their abnormal migration to some other organs and that can lead to the urinary tract infections it's so, although rare but it's a possibility already we have described the epidemiology but just to remind that this infection is more common in a group of people living together like the school children family members because of their extreme contagiousity prevalence already we have mentioned is mostly in the temperate climates like the usa europe and like the other helminthic infestations and the source of infection are infected person or the human this anthroponosis is not genotic and uh, other sources could include like in a bedding night clothing and other fomites present in the household and the most important transmission is fecal oral and also very too important which is very special for this enterobiasis the auto infection the retro infections and also there is a possibility of inhalation and uh, the prevalence can reach up to 50% in the families with the infected child so you can assume that if there is an infected child in the family he can contaminate the other members of the family up to 50% of the family members 
So what are the risk factors for enterobiasis? The first one being the young, because as I've mentioned that, this is most prevalent among children of five to 10 years of age. So these are the people who are mostly affected by enterobiasis. So age is one of the risk factor being young, and this pinworm is usually uncommon below the age of two. And another risk factor is the crowded spaces. So wherever the people are crowding, like the institutions, schools, nursery, the chance of infections are more because of the highly contagious nature. Now come to the diagnosis of this uh, pinworm infection or enterobiasis. The first of all, you have to take the history and if somebody admits the history of perianal pruritis, you can assume that this could be enterobiasis. But for laboratory demonstration, you can demonstrate the adult and you can demonstrate the egg as well. So for adult demonstration, you just uh, can inspect the surface of this tool. If you are lucky, you can see the whitish, small, tiny, thread-like worm on the stool sample. And of course, you have to inspect the perianal skin of the uh, person with a positive history of pruritus and I. And uh, usually, if you examine the stool after an enema, then there is a chance of getting adult worm on the surface of the stool. For demonstrating eggs, usually this is uh, quite uh, uncommon than the other helminthic infestation diagnosis because we examine the stool for the egg, but here we usually do not examine the stool because as you have noticed in the life cycle that the female, gravid female, they come to the perianal skin during the night time in order to lay eggs. So you have to uh, be uh, expecting that you will get the egg on the perianal skin, not the stool sample directly. So the sample should be collected from the perianal region either by the perianal swab or sometimes we can use a different approach we call the scotch tape uh, method. Let me describe the scotch tape method. We know all that scotch tape is a sticky you know, tape which, which you use uh, for many you know, um, uh, purposes in our day-to-day -day life. So this is uh, the scotch tape preparation and you can see that uh, this is a slide fit with this scotch tape and this is a spatula on which the slide is fixed and uh, you can see that the the tape is still attached to the slide uh, is looped over a wooden stick now if you apply this uh, scotch tape uh, to the perianal skin of the suspected person then if anything eggs are laid over the perianal skin they will be sticked on the scotch tape on the on the glue side then if you pull back this scotch tape on the slide and then you you know spread smoothly the scotch tape over the slide then it will be your slide preparation to see under the microscope without any further laboratory procedures now this is a very characteristic you know morphology of the egg plano convex which is whitish in nature because it's non ballistane and uh, this is how you can take the sample by using this cost tape directly from the perianal skin of the suspected person uh, and uh, it will not do the stool examinations because there is a possibility that you will not get the egg in the stool. Also, the NIA swab is as a swab which is specially prepared with the cellophane at the end of the swab stick and you can use the cellophane tip swab stick to collect the sample from the perianal skin and then you need to put the cellophane back onto the slide to in order to examine under the microscope. Now if you get the characteristic egg in the specimen under the microscope your diagnosis will be confirmed. Now you have to treat the patient. So how can you treat that? Yes, uh, of course the drugs are available. Um, you can use the parental pamoid, 11 milligram per kg body weight. This very good drug. Alternatively, you can go for mebendazole, 100 milligram twice daily for three consecutive days. Of course, you can use the most common drug, albendazole, 400 milligram single dose. But sometimes you need to repeat the dose, uh, assuming that the 
you can make sure that you can uh, prevent the reinfection or auto infections in the infected person so this is the treatment now why breaking the life cycle can be difficult as you can assume already that there are few points to be noted in enterobiasis so it is not like the other helminthic infections where we can easily break the chain of the cycle so let me recapitulate the factors which uh, uh, make difficulty in breaking the cycle of this enterobiasis. First of all, the female worm can lay up to 10,000 of egg, highly infected egg in the perineal fold and the infected person. So this is the number of egg is quite high. So uh, this is one factor. The next is the egg can survive up to three weeks on different articles and fomites in the household and that gives a fair chance to be transmitted to members around and last not but the least is the airborne nature of the infection sometimes that can be inhaled and uh, can infect the person through this uh, inhalation route to the other members of the house so altogether these three factors are important for the difficulties in breaking the cycle. So first of all, the high number of eggs and uh, long survival in the fomites and also there is a possibility of airborne infection and uh, deposition onto the food and to be swallowed by the other members in the house. Now regarding the prophylaxis, which can bring the prevention and control of this enterobiasis, what can be done? First of all, the health education on personal hygiene. Because you see, this is the one which is very much related to the personal hygiene, contamination, you know, the habit of uh, putting infected hand to mouth without washing. So you have to be very careful about the health educations and maintaining personal hygiene. So what's your anal area in the morning to reduce the number of eggs in your body so especially you have to ask the children whether they have got the defecation or not in the morning you make them to have it to wash their anal area first uh, thing to be done after getting out of the bed every day then you don't allow people to bath and share towels uh, during the treatment because there is a chance of contamination and of course not during the treatment also but two weeks after the final treatment so that you can minimize the risk of transmission from the infected person uh, by not sharing the you know towels and the bathing area uh, change your underwear and bed linens each day this helps removing eggs because the eggs sometimes can be contaminated can be contracted with the for mites like the bed linens and underwears. Then wash bed sheets and night clothes, underwear and towels in hot water to ensure the killing of the pinworm eggs and then dry them in the high heat. Make sure that the eggs are removed and killed with these procedures. Then uh, don't scratch your anal area. So it's difficult uh, to ensure in the children because if there is an intense itching sensation, then uh, it's uh, logical to scratch. And that's how the infection is uh, transmitted to the self or to the others. So, but you can always supervise the children. And uh, you make sure that the child's nail are trimmed regularly. So there's no space for the collection of the eggs inside the nail bed and discourage nail biting uh, by supervising the children and uh, wash your hands as a you know caring children uh, as a caregiver with the soap, soap and water usually after using the bathroom changing diapers and before handling foods and uh, teach your kids to do the same and sometimes you can use the group chemotherapy especially for the family members because as we have mentioned that 50% uh, of the family member can be infected uh, with one infected child in the family. Now the take home message for this enterobias vermiculares, uh, let me summarize that 
This is uh, also known as the pinworm or sitworm or threadworm, and this is one of the most common intestinal nematode uh, of the large intestine. And um, this is mostly related to the poor hygiene practice and the disease it causes the enterobiasis and uh, this is a worm with the habitat in the cecum and colon along with the trichuris trichuria and uh, the very fascinating statement is that male dies after the mating with the female so you can expect only the female worm if you can uh, get it uh, and the female worms they do migrate out of the colon come to the anus for deposition of egg in the perineal skin and human cat can infection orally we call this um, auto infection and sometimes by the retro infections that the egg can give rise to the larva the larva can crawl back through the anus to come to the large intestine and airborne infection is a possibility although rare so thank you very much for your uh, patience and attention.